Good morning, everyone. Happy Wednesday morning to you, and welcome back to Morning Musings. My name is Don K. Preston. I am the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. Let me remind you of what we are doing. What I am doing is to demonstrate that Matthew chapter 25, 31 and following is about the coming of the Lord to bring in the new creation. It is based upon, it is based upon a host, <laughs> really, of old covenant prophecies. Pardon me, including Joel chapter 3. In those days and at that time, I will gather all nations to judgment. We've covered that. All right. But it's also based upon Isaiah chapter 65. And what I've been focused on last couple of videos is the fact that Isaiah chapter 65 foretold a messianic banquet. My servants shall eat, you shall be hungry. My servants shall drink, you shall be thirsty. And I've shared with you this theme of the messianic banquet is one that is so incredibly rich. Now, listen, it's also called the messianic wedding banquet. We will talk about that. It is also known as the Messianic Resurrection Banquet. The reason for that being, as I pointed out Monday and Tuesday both, is that Isaiah chapter 25, verses 6 through 8, say that the Lord would establish on Zion a great feast, a feast of fat things, a feast of wine on the lees. And on this mountain, the Lord will destroy death. Now, look, ladies and gentlemen, as I said on Monday, uh, unless, you can, unless you can find a way to insert 2,000 years into the little three-letter word and at the, at the beginning of verse 8, there is absolutely no justification for saying, okay, yeah, the Messianic banquet began in the first century, but we're waiting for the resurrection. No, the banquet is for the resurrected. As we shall see when we go to Matthew chapter 8. Now, very, very briefly, do not forget what I shared with you yesterday. Hebrews chapter 12. You have come to Mount Zion. I wonder, have you caught the power of that yet? If it's true that every eschatological element is linked with Zion, judgment, coming of the Lord. You know, the Lord shall come out of Zion. And so all Israel shall be saved. If every eschatological element, if every soteriological element, the word of the Lord shall go forth from Zion, I will place salvation in Zion. So if every soteriological and eschatological tenet is posited in Zion, and Zion therefore was the anticipation, the hope of Israel, so that when Israel's promises were fulfilled, the nations could flow into this Zion. Then it behooves us, it absolutely behooves us to understand the concept of Zion. Now, I'm, I'm going to do something today. Uh, I'm going to go back to a passage that I referred to yesterday but the more I thought about it, the more I thought, you know, I've just got to cover this. And I want to go to Isaiah chapter 62. This passage is incredibly messianic. Over and over and over, the New Testament writers tell us or cite and allude to. Jesus himself draws on this text twice in eschatological passages. Okay. Isaiah 62, verse 1, for Zion's sake, Zion, I will not hold my peace. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest. See, that's, a, that's what, you know, what is known as a Hebrew parallelism, for Zion, for Jerusalem. Anyway, 
until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a lamp that burns the Gentiles. See? Salvation for Israel. The Gentiles shall see your righteousness and all kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. The Lord God shall slay you and call his people by a new name. Isaiah 65. In this new creation. You shall be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord will name. You shall also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of our of your God. You shall you shall no longer be called forsaken, nor shall your land any more be termed desolate. But you shall be called Hephzibah and your land Beulah. See here's uh, here's the remarriage of Yahweh and all twelve tribes. There's a dark lining to that silver cloud. I won't talk about it just yet. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a virgin, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. You see, the marriage permeates this text. Now watch. I have set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem. They shall never hold their peace day or night. You who make mention of the Lord, do not keep silent. Give him no rest until he establishes, until he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. Now, here's what you need to know, okay? The word establishes here, in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, <clears throat> the word establishes is from the Greek word dior. Orthosis. Deorthosis was used in medical literature for resetting a bone. It was used in political literature when injustices prevailed and justice and righteousness and fairness were restored. It is used in financial text in which some kind of financial wrongdoing had been committed. And now payment is made and it makes things right. It sets things back to where they ought to be. Okay, so here is Zion depicted as formerly forsaken. Why? Because of sin. Because she violated Torah. But the Lord says, you will no longer be called forsaken, Zion, okay? And he calls on the watchman, Do, give no peace to Yahweh until he establishes, restores Zion. Now, ladies and gentlemen, in Hebrews chapter 10, 9 and 10, the writer speaks of the old covenant law. The Old Covenant system, specifically in that context, the Old Testament cultus. And he said, it is a parable for the present time. That's his present time, not our present time. It is a parable for the present time in which get, both gifts and offerings are, are offered, which could never take away sin, which could make the offer therefore uh, thereof perfect in regard to conscience. Those things stood in meats and drinks and divers washings, imposed on them until the time of reformation, deorthosis. Very quickly, the old covenant system, meaning Jerusalem and the temple. Now, the temple could be destroyed. And the cultists remain valid. We know that from 586 BC. No question about it. But for the writer's purpose, in Hebrews chapter 9, that cultist would stand valid and imposed, word imposed is epikimai, and it means legally bound, until the time of Reformation. Wait a minute. That Old Testament system could not take away sin. But it would remain valid, imposed 
until the time of Reformation. Well, what would happen at the time of Reformation? Oh, forgiveness would become a reality. Salvation would become a reality. Israel would be restored to her God in a way that she had never been restored before. Isaiah 62, the deorthosis of Jerusalem, Zion. The restoration, the reformation. Hebrews chapter 9, the time of the reformation, the time of the deorthosis. Now watch this. In Isaiah chapter 62, let's start with verse 10. Go through, go through the gates, prepare the way for the people, build up, build up the highway, take out the stones, lift up a banner for the people. Oh boy, this is rich. This is the highway of righteousness upon which the righteous would travel in the kingdom. Isaiah 35, Isaiah 40. And the voice of one crying in the wilderness would say, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. That's what this is all about, ladies and gentlemen. i got to continue. Indeed, the Lord is proclaimed to the end of the earth. Say to the daughter of Zion, surely your salvation, your what? Your deorthosis. Surely your salvation is coming. Behold, his reward is with him, his work before him. And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And you, Zion, shall be called, sought out, a city not forsaken. Oh, wow. Hebrews chapter 12. You have come to Mount Zion. And furthermore, notice again the promise. Say to the daughter of Zion, surely your salvation is coming. His reward is with him. Matthew 16, 27 and 28. The Son of Man will come in the glory of the Father with his angels and shall reward every man according to his works. And verily I say unto you, there are some standing here which shall not taste of death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. What is the kingdom? It's the salvation of Isaiah 62. To come at the coming of the Lord in judgment. When did Jesus say he was coming in the kingdom, in judgment, in reward, in fulfillment of Isaiah 62? Some standing here shall not taste of death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now watch. Later in that very same generation, in Revelation 22, verse 12, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. You see, Isaiah 40 foretold the time of the coming of the Lord and judgment with his salvation. John the baptizer heralded that coming. Isaiah 62 foretold the coming of the Lord with his salvation. In Revelation, we have the prediction well, I'm sorry, in Matthew 16 and in Matthew, uh, Revelation chapter 22, both passages posit that coming of the Lord in fulfillment of Isaiah 62. Folks, this is the time of the Messianic banquet. The Spirit and the bride say, come. Let whosoever will come. Why? Well, because at the time of the destruction of the old covenant Zion, what happens? John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And I saw a new Jerusalem. That's a new Zion. Coming down from God out of heaven. And a voice crying, let us rejoice and be glad. The tabernacle of God is with man. You see the beauty and the power of Zion? Folks, we're not waiting for Zion to come. If we belong to Christ, if we have obeyed him by obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ, we dwell in him and he in us. Hey, I'm completely out of time. Don't forget, two book special. Save yourself almost 19 bucks. 
Go to my website, donkpreston.com, bibleprophecy.com. And do not forget, tomorrow, Thursday, we will have video number six by myself and Mike Sullivan as we critique and we respond to Doug Wilson's current uh, or recent attack on covenant eschatology. You do not want to miss tomorrow's video. So I'll see you on the flip side.